We begin today with one of the most baffling cases in the so-called war on terror, the story of 37-year-old Afia Siddiqui. On Wednesday, a New York court convicted the American-educated Pakistani neuroscientist of attempted murder for shooting at U.S. soldiers and FBI agents while detained in Afghanistan in 2008. Back in 2003, Afia Siddiqui was wanted by law enforcement and the FBI and suspected of links to al-Qaeda leadership. But the MIT-trained scientist had mysteriously disappeared along with her three children, two of whom are U.S. citizens. She reappeared five years later in Afghanistan with her oldest son and was arrested on suspicion of carrying chemicals and notes referring to mass casualty attacks in New York. Afia Siddiqui was not tried on terrorism charges or for her alleged ties to al-Qaeda. The case against her rested on events that took place the day after she was arrested in Afghanistan in July of 2008. The prosecution said she grabbed an unattended rifle and opened fire on a group of U.S. soldiers and FBI agents who were questioning her. None of the Americans was injured, but Siddiqui was shot and wounded while in U.S. custody. Well, on Wednesday, the jury reached a unanimous verdict, finding Siddiqui guilty of attempted murder, armed assault, and using and carrying a firearm. She faces a maximum sentence of life in prison. Defense lawyers argued there was no physical evidence that Siddiqui had touched the rifle. I disagree with the jury's verdict. In my opinion, it is wrong. There was no forensic evidence, and the witness testimony was divergent, to say the least. This is not a just and right verdict. It is a just and right system, but the jury, juries do make mistakes, juries do go wrong, and my opinion is that this was a verdict that was based on fear and not fact. Meanwhile, human rights groups have long alleged that Siddiqui was forcibly disappeared by Pakistani authorities in 2003 and interrogated and tortured at the behest of the United States. In her testimony last week, Siddiqui claimed to have been held in a secret prison by the Americans. For more on the case of Afia Siddiqui, we're joined here by two guests. Tina Foster is the executive director of the International Justice Network. She's a spokesperson for Afia Siddiqui's families. Petra Bartisiewicz is an independent journalist who's been closely following the story. She wrote about Afia Siddiqui in uh, the November issue of Harper's Magazine, the piece called The Intelligence Factory, How America Makes Its Enemies Disappear. She's working on a, bus bu on a book called The Best Terrorists We Could Find, an investigation of terrorism trials in the U.S. since 9-11. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Uh, Tina, let's begin with you. Your response to the verdict. Well, the family's response obviously is one of great disappointment, but I can't say a great deal of shock because from the beginning of this trial, Dr. Afia Siddiqui was portrayed as a terrorist, and instead of assuming the presumption of innocence, which most criminal defendants get when they come into a courtroom, Dr. Afia had already been painted very much as a dangerous woman before she was even brought into the courtroom. And so um, I think we saw during the course of the trial that she um, that she suffered the prejudice that was uh, that had already been laid as a foundation. So the family is going to obviously be calling for an appeal. We're obviously most concerned about Afia's mental state because during the trial she clearly was not herself. She made a number of outbursts during the trial, and we think that is directly related to the trauma that she suffered while in secret prisons and while tortured um, for those five years while she was missing. In addition, she's been in solitary confinement for a year and a half uh, while in U.S. custody. Um, that has also contributed to her deteriorating mental state. And probably, perhaps most importantly, uh, why my organization became involved in this case is um, the two children, the two youngest children of Dr. Afia, who were three months old and four years old when they were captured, are still missing. And the International Justice Network uh, believes that those children were also p taken into detention um, at the same time that Afia was, and we're still looking for those two children. And the decision of the, of the government, uh, even though the alleged crime that she was on trial for happened in Afghanistan, to have the trial here in New York, what was the basis for that? Well, I mean, I think that, that this is a pattern that we've seen, actually, since 9-11 of um, individuals who um, should probably stay in the criminal justice systems of the places where they are detained, being shifted around in sort of a shell game. I think Afia Siddiqui was likely in a number of secret prisons in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, before she came to be in U.S. custody. When she, became, when she came into U.S. custody, um, the first 
that we had heard from the family after five years of her disappearance was that she had she was at Bagram Hospital in U.S. custody and she had been shot several times. And the explanation that was given were the facts that were alleged um, in the shooting. Uh, Petra Bartosiewicz, let's go back to the beginning. You wrote this very interesting story in Harper's Magazine about Afia. Um, tell us how you got interested, and then tell us her story from the beginning, this MIT-trained neuroscientist. What happened to her? Well, I first heard about the case uh, in August 2008 when she was brought uh, to the United States from Afghanistan. And as Tina was saying, um, the, the issue of why she was brought here, she was entitled to a, a consular visit in Afghanistan, which she didn't receive. Um, and the, the jury was told that she was brought to the United States to face charges because she opened fire on U.S. soldiers, and that was the justification. But um, the what the jury didn't hear is this huge backstory in this case, which kind of gives it the all-important context. And I think the trial sort of happened in a vacuum where uh, it was just about this shooting in a room. But what they were not told was that she'd been missing for five years and that when she went missing uh, in 2003, she was uh, a suspected al-Qaeda operative. And she was never charged with that uh, in this case. When you say she went missing, where was she? Well, she, she went missing from Karachi, Pakistan. That's most of the reports. Um, she's a, she actually spent um, about 11 years in the United States. Uh, she was educated in the U.S. She uh, came to the U.S. from Pakistan, and uh, she joined her brother in Houston. Uh, he lives in Houston now. And uh, she studied at MIT and Brandeis. And she, um, two of her three children were born in the U.S. She was married uh, in the U.S. Uh, to a Pakistani man. And she lived a normal life until just after 9-11 when uh, there were some reports that uh, brought mainly her husband I think at the time under suspicion and th they were interviewed by the FBI and nothing really came of it. Um, she eventually returned to Pakistan. She divorced and then uh, in 2003 she went missing but um, right around the time she went missing there were uh, increasing reports that she was wanted for questioning um, and then later she was named an al-Qaeda suspected al-Qaeda operative um, but for five years no one heard anything about her well and your efforts to get to the 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 backstory as you say you you traveled all over Pakistan uh, she comes from a very prominent family you, you, you suggested uh, in the article and you interviewed several of the relatives and generally the press accounts there assumed she was uh, uh, in uh, CIA or US custody during all that time yes I think the the main uh, the story that most people believe in Pakistan is that she was picked up but by Pakistanis. I think uh, the conventional wisdom is that the U.S. Uh, intelligence community relies on the Pakistani intelligence community very heavily. Um, and so the belief is that she would have been picked up by the Pakistanis, and my reporting uh, suggested that as well, and that she was either handed over to the CIA uh, immediately or soon after, or at some point, um, some people are held in what is called custodial. Um, uh, in a custodial situation where the Pakistanis might have control over them physically, but uh, the U.S. Uh, has access to question them. Um, there are numerous documented accounts of that. And um, the belief was, though, that she was picked up. Now, there are also reports that she was um, on the run for some period of time, but um, it does seem that she was held somewhere for some period of this time. The title of your article, The Intelligence Factory, How America Makes Its Enemies Disappear, what do you mean by that? Well, the war on terrorism is fought largely through intelligence gathering, uh, not really evidence building as in a, in a, a crime like a, a murder, for example, where you're going back after the fact. Um, terrorism is fought mainly in terms of future, what is going to happen, who might do something, what might they do. And intelligence is sort of the fodder for, for these investigations. But intelligence is primarily produced by detainees. And so we sort of are in this position now where we are needing to pr produce more and more detainees who then produce that intelligence. And because uh, we now have all of these confirmed reports about the types of interrogations that are happening, we know that there's a lot of false intelligence being generated, and that leads to other people being detained. And I think the main um, tool that uh, investigators use these days is kind of associations, who knows whom, and that's the primary, that's the primary connection that gets people on the radar. The question of what the relationship actually means, which is uh, all important, um, is less investigated.